So, in 2003, my wife and I were $32,000 in debt, which for a student pastor, and I was paid well for a student pastor, but for a student pastor and a middle school teacher, that's still a lot of debt. So we had a little bit of medical, we had some car, we had some student loans, and I remember we said, we want to get rid of this debt, and so we scheduled an appointment with somebody who seemed to know something about finances. And so we walked into our executive pastor's office, and there he sat behind this beautiful rose mahogany colored desk, and he looked very important to me, and I always thought this guy is brilliant. And I said, Pastor Ed Deming, <clears throat> how do we get rid of this debt? I've told this story all over the country. I actually tell this story in the book. And Ed looked at us and he said, why do you want to get rid of this debt? And it was a great question. And he said, because if your why is strong enough, you'll endure any what, or was it how? I forget. I didn't realize at the time it was actually Nietzsche he was quoting, but I listened to him because it sounded smart. <laughs> he said, keep your receipts for 30 days, which we did, and then come back and we'll take a look at it. And we came back with our why and we said, the reason is we want for Liz to be able to stay home so that we can start a family and so that she doesn't have to work outside of the home. And Ed said, if you will work this particular plan, you can actually get rid of all of that debt in one year. And I said, sweetheart, hallelujah, we're getting a raise. <laughs> and I got something much better than a raise. I got wisdom and a plan. And we worked that plan, and actually in 11 months, we're able to get rid of every penny of it. So I'm grateful to God, and I'm grateful to this dude right here, because that was a moment that I look back on that changed my life, and I didn't know it in the moment. It's actually the ordinary moments if you're obedient to God's principles that lead you into a future that you never imagined was possible. And so I wonder, well, what if I didn't know this stuff? I wonder if other people don't know this stuff. So we started teaching those principles that were based on something called Dave Ramsey's Financial Peace University. Dave Ramsey's in the house over there, ladies and gentlemen. We started teaching those principles, and in 2012, we took 654 people from our congregation in Winston-Salem through that 13-week experience, and collectively, they retired $1.5 million in debt and saved $750,000, a $2.2 million turnaround in 13 weeks. That's a lot of money. But one of the things that I noticed is that even when people are out of debt, they can still be greedy. Even when people are very wealthy, they can be very fearful. Even when people are very poor, they can actually be very greedy. And we realize this in the teachings of Jesus, and he taught so much about finances, not because God cares about money. I think I care even less about it, but because we care about it. And Jesus knew that our relationship between our resources and God was inextricably linked because I think that Jesus was somehow present as the cosmic Christ, even in that garden as things were being formed. In fact, Colossians would say everything that has been made has been made by him, for him, through him. Yes? So we started teaching those principles, and we started to see results on the outside, but I started to notice something. Not everybody thought and felt about finances the same. I started to notice that some people love to use money in very hospitable ways, other people were more maximizers with their money. And then other people love to create these beautiful experiences and environment with the way that they use money. Other people are very much networkers with the way that they use money. And so I started paying attention to it, and because I believe that we're made in God's image, and because I believe that to be made in God's image means that we are to be stewards of creation and its resources, which has come to include money, then I asked the question, well, what if these tendencies or types or instinctive ways of relating to finances are actually flowing from what it means to be made in God's image? And so I started paying attention in the scripture, and I started to notice that Abraham embodied these Abrahamic uh, hospitable tendencies. He had these tendencies to where he would use resources in very hospitable ways. Isaac was dis is disciplined, though. He's different from Abraham. And Jacob is different still. 
So in the summer of 2014, hopped on a plane, which I don't do often. I don't like flying because I like control. Hopped on a plane and went to Falls Village, Connecticut, and spent a week during the Feast of Shavuot, which is coming up. You're all going to celebrate it. It's going to be great. In fact, you are kind of Shavuotites if you're in this church, most likely. It's Pentecost, people. Pentecost. And so I was up there, and they had never heard of Pentecost, and I never heard of Shavuot. And I was sitting in, inside of a room, and I saw this dude sitting across the way, and he had this sick beard. I mean, it was just unbelievable. He's a rabbi. He had on skinny jeans and some skater shoes, like some cons or something. I thought, this is my kind of rabbi, right? Like, you can't be a great rabbi without a great beard. You know what I mean? Unless you're like a woman rabbi, and at that point, you just got to say, pluck that, honey. That's getting too long. It's just awkward. But I thought, I want to talk to this dude, and his name was Arthur. And it was, it was kind of sketched on the front of it. I thought, he looks cool to me. So I sat down with Arthur up under this big, white, open-air tent that might remind you of the revival days when they used to have sawdust floors, and you would all sit around together and hear the preacher until midnight. I'm not going to go that long. And so I saw Arthur, and I said, hey, would you mind having dinner with me? And he said, of course. I said, now, you, you, uh, you, you know the Old Testament very well. You're a rabbi. He said, son, we call that the Bible. You'll get that on the way home. Okay, you may never get that, actually, but it's okay. Um, and so I, I said to him, uh, I'm starting, you believe that to be made in God's image means to be a steward of creation and resources. Yes, of course. I said, well, is there anything in the tradition? I said, because I'm starting to see these seven types of the way that people relate to money, what I'll call money types. I'm starting to see them in the lives of seven biblical characters. He said, well, who are they? I said, well, Abraham tends to have these hospitable tendencies with resources. He said, okay. I said, Isaac tends to be very disciplined with resources, more of a maximizer. He said, okay. I said, Jacob is more beautiful. He's extravagant with resources. He said, stop. And I thought, I have committed heresy. The rabbi is about to smack me. This is not going to go well. But he looked at me and he said, would you like me to finish your list for you? He said, you would know this because you're not Jewish, but it's been in the Jewish tradition for a long time that there are seven attributes of God's image. Now, nobody can know the full essence of the interiority of a God who is spirit, but in the tradition, what we see from the activity of God is that the image of God is actually sevenfold. And so we see this play out in the lives of seven shepherds who came to lead God's people into their future, which was actually a restoration of their past. So you realize that the further we go into the future, we're actually just going back into the original intent that we had in the very beginning. We live between gardens. And our assignment is to partner with God toward the restoration of that. And so I want to read to you just briefly that passage I've been alluding to all morning. God said, let us make humankind in our image according to our likeness. So God created humankind in his image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it. And have dominion over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air and over every living thing that moves upon the earth. Genesis 1, 26 to 28. Now, the assignment of God image humans was to multiply and care for creation as resources, which has come to include money. And forevermore, human fulfillment, a sense of peace and wholeness, would be wrapped up in how well we carried out this assignment. Thereby, the image of God would fill the whole earth with God's love and light all over the place all the time. And we've already talked about how that has been fractured. But no matter how fractured it is, I look across the auditorium this morning and I see the image of God staring back at me. You remind me of something of the divine. As Leonard Fain, a Jewish writer, said, we are called to see the beauty through the blemishes, to believe it can be restored, and to feel ourselves implicated in its restoration. We are called to be fixers. The story unfolds, and over the course of hundreds of years, God used seven individuals to shepherd God's people back into a relationship with himself, back into God's ways. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, Moses, Aaron, and David, the tradition tells us. Through their lives and teachings, they carry a special message into the earth to remind us of what it's like to do life with God, indeed, what it's like to be made in God's image. Each of these seven revealed one special attribute of what it means to be made in God's image. Individually, they teach us something. Abraham offers God's hospitality. Isaac demonstrates God's discipline. Jacob reflects God's beauty. Joseph reflects God's connection, if we can pull up on the screen here this morning. 
Moses represents God's endurance, Aaron humility, and David leadership. And what I've noticed in coaching literally thousands of people in the area of their finances is that you are going to relate to all of these at some level. In other words, to have the fullness of all of these functioning to the utmost degree in one person in the Jewish tradition, they would say you are beholding the Messiah. And in the Christian tradition, that Messiah has a name. And so you're going to resonate with these if you think about it in your relationship to finances above the rest. And if you can understand, okay, this is the type with which I'm most resonating, then that's going to help you understand why you're doing what you're doing with money. And if you understand why you're doing what you're doing with money, then you can change what you're doing with money. And if you understand the type with which you most resonate, then you understand this is an aspect of God's image that is coming through very strong in my life. And if I lean into that, it might remind the world around me that God is hospitable, that there is a discipline element to God, that God is beautiful, that God is the connection, the very fabric and ground of our being, that God is enduring, that God, as we see in Jesus especially, is humble and that God is our leader as well.